Okay, I'm going to get started. So, welcome to the last technical session of LCA 2010. Uh, I'm Conrad Parker. The title of this talk on the program is Sharing User Space I.O. Devices for Fast Access to Multimedia Hardware. Probably a better title for the talk would be for Access to Fast Multimedia Hardware. I'm going to tell you about some cool hardware that I've been playing with um, and how we can access that through UIO and using a resource management layer called UIO Mux that I've worked on. Um, UIO Mux lets you basically lock Hardware devices gives you memory management for them so that you can manage them from within user space, and it gives you flexibility to build these devices into different kinds of multimedia frameworks and different kinds of applications um, for different kinds of Linux systems. And um, it, it gives you lots of, lots of cool advantages. The main advantage is that it gives you some, a lot of flexibility. Um, and what I'm going to concentrate on talking about here is a VU unit, which is a color space conversion unit, which I'm feeding bad values into for this uh, um, demo here, um, which allows you to do color space conversion and cropping and scaling and, and things like that. Um, the, uh, there's also video encoding and decoding hardware and so on, and um, a stack which is built on top of this using GStreamer and making that available so you can write really simple conventional applications which still give you... Uh, Hardware flexibility. It's a stateful shared library. I might rant a little bit about what that means at some point during this talk, I'm not sure. Um, it allows you to do in-process device access without context switching. This is where I work. This is the um, Nihonbashi exit of Tokyo Station. I live in Tokyo and Japan basically because I like trains, um, all kinds of trains, and uh, I especially like you know the, the journey more than the destination. <laughs> This is, the, uh, this is a Hitachi Super, a super Hitachi train, which um, uh, th there was a processor developed for that called the Super Hitachi processor, which developed in the Super H processor, which is used in the Seeger Saturn, which got um, formed into a company, uh, got spun out into a company called Renesis, which is a uh, merger between Hitachi and Mitsubishi's semiconductor divisions. That's who I work for now. In a couple of months' time, we're going to merge with NEC Electronics, a slightly smaller company, to become the largest electronics um, semiconductor manufacturer in Japan. And what's really cool is that we do a lot of Linux kernel work. So this is uh, the 2632 um, uh, Linux Weekly News ranking by employers and the amount of kernel uh, patches that we do, mainly by these two guys here who I work with, Paul Munt and Magnus Dam. Uh, good friends of mine, great to get into any kind of political discussion and argument with. We do all our stuff upstream, um, so we uh, have recently, in, instead of just pushing out customized BSPs, um, we have an in-house Debian developer and um, the Debian SH port, which is done through Debian ports, is now becoming a, a um, uh, well, it's, it's in unstable or whatever, it's becoming an official Debian archive, Debian um, repository. Um, that said, we, uh, Renesis has recently released a uh, chip which has a Cortex-A8 core as well. Um, so we're sort of diversifying on the instruction sets that, that are used as well. So um, very sort of flexible. Basically, what the point I wanted to make is here is not that um, it is not just that you know we're a big company doing lots of scary stuff, but um, that we're really pushing everything upstream and seeing Linux and uh, open source work as a really important uh, important thing to be doing. Um, and so I'm, yeah, I'm really happy with be able to work there on this kind of thing, like these security cameras, you're being monitored right now and it's all being sent to our um, secret alien headquarters. Um, this is using obviously this kind of Ken Burns effect thing where you zoom and pan across um, a still picture like, like you guys. And, um, and this is used in kind of movie, uh, sorry, Ken Burns was an American documentary filmmaker um, and he would take still images and say, this guy in the middle w w was a famous bank robber and then became a cheese merchant. And he met this guy here, the red shirt, who... I'm not going to make it up worse than that. The way that you can do this kind of thing is um, obviously just by simply zooming, cropping across the image. So I'm going to talk about some of the hardware that does that. Um, in this processor, which is in the board I've got here, this is the... Um, SH Mobile 7724. I'm going to move this down so you can see it. It's kind of 
kind of work. Okay. Um, this has lots of, um, it's basically a system on chip. So it has an instruction call, which is a normal processor here running, uh, running an SH instruction set. It has video processing units. It has, um, it has sound stuff. It has um, things for controlling various uh, I.O. devices as well. And these can be hooked up and shared in different ways. Um, this is the board that I've got here. The one I have has an LCD panel on top of it. And we're kind of um, starting to make these as boards which are available for hobbyists and stuff as well. Um, generally what we do, of course, is um, the, the main product is the, is the processors and some of the um, uh, smaller uh, chips around it, such as um, image separate image processing chips that can be used and things like that. The main thing here is to evaluate the processor itself. Um, and in order to do that, we build a, a board which you, know, you can run a full Linux system on. And in the course of doing that, we often end up having to write drivers for other companies' products as well. And because we have this upstreaming policy, we end up writing, you know, um, putting a lot of, us, uh, of stuff upstream. So a lot of those patches that I was talking about before are not necessarily for our products. They're just things that we got running so that people can run boards like this. And so, of course, that helps everybody. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the purple things here and, and here. Um, actually, the ones on the bottom, you don't, oh, no, VOU, JPU, okay. Um, the VPU is a video processing unit. Um, the, we can't see them here, I'm going to skip to this list here. Um, there are various IP blocks. Uh, CU is a camera unit. VU, video, uh, video engine unit, a blending engine unit, JPEG unit, video processing, LCD controller, video out, sound, things like that. Um, and each of these can be independently controlled. Video processing unit, I'm not going to talk about too much today because it does like non-free codecs and stuff and you need a binary blob to actually get the H.264 um, support. The CU is a camera interface and it basically gives you a standardized interface for certain color spaces that you can get off a camera sensor. What's important here is that the CU is part of the system on chip. Um, you can talk directly to it and get, get video data, but of course that, that data comes from the sensor, which is over here somewhere. That's the thing that has the CCD and you know, converts to digital stuff. Uh, uh, camera or capture engine unit, I forget. Um, so that's, that's a particular block within the, uh, within the system on chip. Uh, the VEUs, the video engine unit, um, it allows you to do some image processing in memory. And what's interesting here is that we kind of use this kind of like a coprocessor um, where you give, it a, uh, you give it the input and output address that you want it to operate on. You set some registers to tell it what kind of operation you want it to do. Um, and then it just does that when it's done. It gives you an interrupt, and then you can um, come back and work on that. Um, you can do color space conversion as well. So the, uh, first of all, the scaling and cropping and so on. Um, my, yes, 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 yes. I'm not sure that's yeah. good, good, good. Uh, scaling and cropping. So at the same time as you are um, saying, here's the input and here's the output, you also give it a stride value, which tells you how much to skip it, um, or how wide you think your lines are, and how much of that you give it a width telling you how much you want to use. Um, you, can do scropping, you can do cropping from this. Like what I'm doing here in this demo is I've got a, um, a 720p capture of this sensor. So that's 1,200 pixels wide by 720 lines. Um, and I'm cropping to a VGA size window inside of that. And I'm moving that window around, encoding that window to H.264. Um, I'm going to show you what this demo does before I move on to the next thing. How much of this, what can we read here? So in this terminal here, which I'm going to There we are. 
this terminal here. So I'm running this program, sh codex record. Um, it basically just reads off the camera. It reads Dali's out of control file, telling it how much, um, uh, telling it what encoding parameters to use and so on. Um, and this control file is set up for VGA and it tells the encoder to basically print the standard output. So it's just a command line program that will spit H.264 encoded data off the camera to standard output. Um, SIG HTTPD or SITE or whatever I want to call it is a, um, just a trivial HTTP server which takes whatever it gets off standard input and then keeps looping that. Um, so it keeps that in a ring buffer and then takes client requests and serves that out over HTTP on whatever port you give it. And then down here, I was just running in mplayer. Um, mplayer with the HTTP address of this server here um, and playing that stream. And I hacked up the, normally the recorder just sits there like that, but I was a bit bored last night, so I hacked it up to pan around. Um, and I think I caused some ghosting effects by screwing up some of the color, uh, color plane values, but you know, that happens. Okay, um, my God. I just switched to Xmonad again yesterday because, um, because life wasn't exciting enough, because GNOME just wasn't working for me. Okay. This is great. Right. So the video engine unit can do many different things. It can scale and crop like what I was just talking about. It can do all kinds of bizarre filtering and mirroring and things like that. Um, and it can do color space conversion. And what I really think is in, the best way to explain color space conversion is through the use of uh, New Zealand's beautiful natural, natural animals, such as, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, this dude here who is the takahe. And the takahe is an endangered animal. Um, it was first discovered in about 1898, and there were some, like, uh, some reported sightings of it um, in the South Island. And uh, it was thought to be totally extinct, and then around 1950 or something, it was kind of discovered again. So if you ever see one, then you're very, very lucky, basically. Um, the takahe is most, whoa. Don't give the game away. God damn. <sighs> I hate this. <laughs> okay, I'm going to quit one of these. Gonna go there, gonna go there. Ah, I did something with that. Okay. My God. Close that. Go here. Um, the Takahe is mostly known for having, um, if you get a, um, a model Takahe like this one here, it's most famous for having red, green, and blue plumage. That's the most important thing to remember about the Takahe. This is not working. Um, this, is a, this is a standard image for, um, the, for explaining color space conversion, basically. Um, this is a full color image, and we know that when we get it off a, um, when we're seeing light, then it has red, green, and blue components, um, and that's how you display it on, um, on this kind of screen, this is how we see that. But it's uh, more beneficial to break it up into Y, U, and V components, where um, the Y component gives you the, um, the intensity of the light, and two chroma components, which you can encode at a much lower resolution. If you went to Durf's talk about Fiora, then I'm sure he was talking all about that. I'm going to skip through that. Um, basically, you do. Uh, um, you have a linear formula for for that. You have some set parameters, set um, values for for the color space. This one, which is used in SD video, substitute those in, um, scale and crop into the range into a range that you can use for digital, uh, for eight bit, leaving some headroom for um, for manipulations. You can solve that for RGB to go back the other way. There's going to be a quiz at the end of this. HD video itself has different coefficients which do the same kind of thing, um, which end up with different, uh, 
different values, and of course, they'll look slightly different if you screw that up. JPEG is different again. It allows you to use the full 0 to 255 range. Um, and I, I once had this interesting uh, thing where I thought that uh, basically we had this image where all the white stuff, like if you point at a bright light, point the camera to a bright light or something, and then you're converting, and then it would come back as, um, as bright green. You get these little bright green patches everywhere. And so we went and we, looked, we checked out you know, all the specs on the, v, on the VU and what color spaces we were um, setting it up in, double-checked everything and put in different parameters and whatever. And then the guys who were testing that came back and said, yep, great, you fixed the bug, this is excellent. And then um, found out that the actual problem was a dodgy cable in the first place. But hey, that happens. Um, the point is that this is a very repetitive calculation. You just do this linear math. You do the same thing for every single pixel in the image. Um, we need to do this for, for all video applications. So anytime you're encoding video, you're basically getting some input data in some kind of color space off the camera. Um, if you're encoding it into MPEG-4 or Fiora or something, then you're going to need to convert it into a particular YUV-420 color space or something like that, um, depending on the encoded setup. Um, if you're getting decoded data from a codec and you want to display it on a screen, like on the screen of your phone or on the um, TV or something, then you're going to have to uh, put it back to RGB usually. Um, and these are all very expensive operations. And you don't want to, obviously you don't want to be spinning your CPU for this. And even if you do have a DSP on chip that you can program and tell it to do that, then you're basically going to be wasting a whole lot of its time doing this kind of stuff. So hey, we just give it its own whole dedicated hardware block that then allows us to do scaling, cropping, and so on as well. OK. So that's basically the, um, the hardware that we have available. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to concentrate on the, um, how we use the VU, how we access it, and how we do resource management for it. Um, and to do something like this, where we have a camera set up. The kernel interfaces that we use the V4L2, FBeta, obviously, um, well, for a simple output like this, and UIO, user space IO. V4L2 is, this, obviously, it's a standard um, Linux kernel capture interface. Who here, is, who here has not played with the V4L2 or used a V4L2 camera? A couple of people? OK. <laughs> a couple of people pointing to other people. Um, so it's, a, uh, it's been around for, for a long time, and it, um, generally it has, very simple, uh, it has a very simple streaming read interface where you, use a, uh, you can use a straight read system call. This is pretty inefficient, but it does mean you can just go open the device, read data, um, you know, you read into your own buffer just like you were reading from a file or something, and then do whatever you want with it. Um, it works, but there's a whole lot of copying going on. There's an IOCTAL interface where um, you map some buffers from the from the V4L2 device, um, and then you just call some ioctals to Q and DQ frames um, into those. Um, there's also a, a newer interface called User Pointer, and um, this is part of the V4L2 spec. As far as I know, we're the only people who've actually implemented it. What it allows you to do is an application can say, here's my memory buffers. Please record into these. Um, and that's important for the kind of, of um, frameworks that we're setting up here. Um, V4L2 also allows you to configure the camera so you can set up, um, you can tell it to play with brightness and contrast and, and stuff like that. Um, so I, I mentioned that for us, the CEU, the camera engine unit, is part of the system on chip, whereas the sensor itself is elsewhere. Often each of these things may have their own, they can do some kind of conversions or they can, um, uh, y you can obviously tell the sensor to modify its, um, who is a camera nerd? Um, you know, thingy, when it gets bright and dark and stuff like that. Both of those. Um, and, so, uh, and so you can tell it to control that, whereas some things uh, might be handled directly by the CEU. Um, FBDEV is the straight frame buffer interface. Um, very simple. You can just get a pointer to the frame buffer and you write into it. Uh, you copy memory into it. You write data into it. Um, you can also configure what the frame buffer is going to be. Okay, UIO is mainly what I'm talking about here, not UIO itself, but later I'll talk about how to um, how we configure it. Um, it's the Linux kernel mechanism. It does allow you to write uh, device drivers in user space, basically because it gives you a very thin interface to the kernel. Um, and um, 
the basic, uh, and then the actual logic for controlling the device is uh, something that you might implement in user space. So, um, so the, what, what would normally be an entire in-kernel device driver is split into two parts. So the kernel module is very small. It gives you memory maps for controlling the device and so on, um, and implements uh, uh, some basic stubs for I.O. interrupt handling and so on. Um, and the user space device driver is the user space application. Um, and it, it's user space, it uses system calls to interface with that. Um, there's a good Linux Weekly News article about UIO. Um, I'll just give a very brief uh, summary. So on the kernel side, um, you, uh, at least what we do, um, so the IQ number flags, hand on and so on, uh, when the, the uh, kernel driver receives an interrupt, it has to translate that into something that, a, that the user space program can see. Um, so the kernel driver actually acknowledges the interrupt and then remembers that it happened and then when user space is ready, it tells it about it. Um, array of memory areas, the way we use that is that we, um, we memory map the uh, register window for the, um, for the device, like the VU control registers, um, and another memory area which I'll talk about later. Um, and then you implement file ups as well. On the user space side, you open dev UIO something. You can then pull that file descriptor. So the kernel remember that an interrupt came in. It will then make um, that file descriptor readable. So you can basically, you can pull it, you can just read and block on it or whatever. Um, and that's how you can wait until something is ready. So it sounds kind of convoluted, but for this kind of thing, it works pretty well. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is um, the libraries that run on top of this. So LibUIOMux is the main thing here, which, uh, which manages these things. The best HVU is a simple um, driver library for the, uh, for the VEU. SH Codex I'm not going to talk about is for um, it's the main thing I work on. It's for uh, the video encoding and decoding and stuff. Um, OpenMax components and GStreamer components. So, uh, I'll describe how they are influenced by, um, by the lower levels and what kind of things you can build with them. All these things are available on, um, on my GitHub repositories. Okay, UIOMUX. So it's a library, right? It's a user level library. Um, and it bas you can basically say, here's a named, I want access to this named resource. Give me, um, let me access it. Give me some memory out of it and so on. Um, so there's LibioIOMUX. It, it actually manages a shared memory segment, and that, uh, that memory segment is shared amongst all processors, but there's no, there's no UIOMUX um, daemon running, okay? So the way, that it, uh, the way that it differs from something like Dbus is that it has this shared state. Um, it's just, a, it's just a, a library that you link against, and you can find that shared state, and you can manipulate it, and you can manipulate it in a way that is guaranteed to be, um, that is atomic, um, and so you get system-wide locking, you can manage contention, and so on. We keep locks for each resource that you're asking for, so uh, when you get a handle on to you get a handle onto multiple onto whatever um, resources are available. So you say, I want, I want to be able to access the VU and the VPU and, and whatever, and then you say, I want to lock the VU, um, and then no one else can use that at the same time. The reason for that with these particular devices is, uh, is pretty obvious. Basically, you can't do two operations at the same time. So you're setting it up. You're saying, please do this big color space conversion. You know, call me when you're done. And you want to make sure that no one else comes along and tries to do the same thing. So we can sequence across those. And um, and the memory maps, basically the, uh, I'm going to explain what, what memory is mapped. Um, but basically you want to make sure that different, um, different processes don't stomp on each other for using the memory areas which are reserved for each device. Okay, so basically, obviously, you've got, you know, uh, you've got physical memory, you've got some virtual memory. Um, 
this kind of idea per process or whatever. Um, for these devices, uh, normally what's going on is to implement this, you have a CPU, you have a memory management unit, which um, lets you do this translation from virtual to physical, keeps that in, in check, manages the cache, that's important, arbitrates the bus. So if anything else is also accessing that RAM, then it can make sure that um, stuff maybe happens in sync, as long as the other stuff is uh, aware of what's going on. With the VU, you don't have that, okay? So um, part of the way this has all been implemented so that it's low power and fast and fits on like a processor the size of your thumb that you can just drop in the gutter or whatever, um, is that the VU totally skips out on all this coolness. Um, so it does not have access to, uh, to the bus arbitration. It doesn't have access to the cache or the address translation. So basically, any time we give a uh, data to the VEU, it has to be in uncached memory, and we have to give it the physical address. Okay? So that's just, that's just a restriction on that. Um, and that data then has to be contiguous. So if we have a large video frame, we have to be able to give it the base address of that in memory that we've guaranteed that it, uh, is uncached. Um, and of course, the only way to guarantee that it's uncached is to pre-allocate that in the kernel. So the kernel will actually reserve some memory, mark it as, un as not cacheable, um, and then those, those regions are what are made available through UIO. So when UIO exports some maps, it says, this is a base address and this is, how, this is how big it is, whatever. It's up to the driver to understand what to do with those things. So we, are, we export two maps. One I mentioned before is for the um, actual register window. The other is for memory, which you're just reserving to use for this device. So frame, basically frame buffer memory. Um, then what UIO marks can do is when you ask for memory, it will give you some memory out of that pool, allocate that, make sure that different applications don't stomp on each other. That's the basic idea. Um, in a bit more detail, what we can do with, uh, so I mentioned V4L2 user pointer. So if we're uh, doing something really simple, we're going to capture some data from the sensor, it goes to the CEU, the camera engine unit. So um, each of these things, actually the last thing should say LCDC, the LCD controller, which is also on the, on the chip, right? Um, what we want to do is uh, capture data, convert it into RGB, put it onto the LCD. Um, we set up these buffers using UIO marks. We uh, allocate it from the reserved region. We, uh, we then tell V4L2 using the user pointer to capture directly into that buffer. So we've set it up, we know what it is. V4L2 doesn't need to know anything about it. Um, we can convert that to get a physical address for the VU to use. We also have a destination buffer, which has a physical address. If we weren't doing our bookkeeping nicely, we can, um, uh, we, uh, we can call this to vert to get back a um, virtual address for that same frame buffer that we just converted into and we pass the virtual address to the LCD controller. Um, in a real application, you don't always need to call all these functions, of course, but that's the basic idea. So you can do some kind of virtual to physical mappings in your application when you're setting up what buffers you're going to be passing around. And that way you can set up a, um, a pipeline of some description. OK, but that's pretty tedious, right? So what we actually really want to do is we don't want to be writing all this glue code all the time. It's great to have the framework in place. Um, it's great to have this kind of flexibility, but we don't want to be messing around with, um, with this buffer management manually, continuously. We want to be able to use normal media frameworks. When someone is going to write a video application, they just want to chuck together a GStream or pipeline on the command line or whatever, make it work. Um, so basically what we, uh, what we can do, there's this uh, concept, and it kind of comes from OpenMax, but it's starting to creep in GStream a bit now as well. Um, I talked a little bit about this at the um, mo uh, mobile miniconf last year, um, where, you, where you can do tunneling, where you have, um, if you have two components, so in the GStreamer space, you have two components, one doing you know, video capture and the other one doing encoding or something, and they both happen to be using hardware blocks, and if you plug them together, then they will just pass a pointer to each other and they will tunnel that data through and negotiate it. If, however, you plug one of them into a normal GStreamer software block, then you will, do, you will use normal GStreamer software buffers. So, what we, uh, so basically what's, what's cool then is that you can 
get this kind of negotiation and all the buffer management and locking and so on, um, all, all the negotiation handled by the media framework um, and still take advantage of the hardware underneath. Um, GStreamer has really good negotiation for that. So when you build this kind of um, uh, pipeline where you're doing the hardware, hardware copies or hardware um, negotiation below, but you're using GStreamer to work out what exactly is going on, then at the end of the day, you can just plug um, plug plugins together, and if they're hardware, if they're all hardware accelerated, talking to each other, it'll run quickly. If any of them aren't, okay, you're running in software. Um, and basically, where we're going with this is that you can take a plain GStreamer pipeline. This is the kind of thing that we're building up um, for. This is like a dual camera encoder kind of thing, doing RTP, and individually take any of these, take some of these um, encoders and uh, and VFL2 and stuff like that and replace them with hardware accelerated components. And the, nego the negotiation can happen um, between, between the plugins, and then you actually get this kind of, um, uh, you get the hardware accelerated pipeline, you get zero copy between, um, between each of the components. Um, just before I finish up, there's uh, some of the guys working on, um, on the OMAP pipeline, or uh, there's some work going on V4L2 at the moment to do this kind of pipelining, but um, basically configuring the system to do that itself and doing all that in kernel within V4L2. Um, this is probably more appropriate for that kind of environment, but for what we're doing, uh, what we're doing gives us a lot of flexibility and it basically allows us to use different kinds of frameworks for different kinds of environments. So you can use GStream, you can use OpenMax, whatever. You can write a custom function, um, a custom application. And you don't need to dedicate particular blocks to always be available as part of um, some application layer. So because we're trying to, um, we're not building a single device, we're actually building generic uh, Linux infrastructure for different people to make different kinds of devices on. Different people might configure them in different ways. So we really like the kind of flexibility where if you want to set up um, for example, if you want to set up a system which uh, uses the, the blending unit to do X overlays or something, um, but uses the DSP for math, you know, for processing earthquake data or something like that, then, you know, you can do that. You're not constrained to having um, particular things set up in a, in a particular way. So basically, just summary, this, uh, this hardware is really cool, has some really nice features, um, and what we do is we provide a really simple UIO interface to these. And the, uh, the win is that we can use existing flexible um, media frameworks and the people writing these applications don't need to know all the details that are going on underneath. Okay, any questions? Uh, this is a little bit from left field, but um, you're talking about how um, one of the components needed basically physical memory and it had to be contiguous. Have there been any thought about how that would work in conjunction with virtualization where you, both of those things become much more difficult? Uh, sorry, if, if one of the components needs a physical address, how would that work in a virtualization environment? Basically, yeah. Well, actually, that, that one is easy. It's the contiguous memory that's... Yeah, easy. right. Um, Yeah, I think I think some of the future devices will have uh, the MMU available for these blocks, and that will make that kind of thing easier. Okay. Uh, I was just yeah. curious. I don't know if you've done any work on that. So. No. <laughs> Thank you. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. What's your GitHub address? What is your uh, GitHub address? Uh, Kfish. There, is it written? There, down the bottom. Uh, you did one with GUI doing embedded system type thing without mm -hmm. a uh, without proper isolation between user space processes because you're not using the MMU on the on the uh, on on the I/O device. Can you see this extending to like server systems or something like that where you actually need something like that? 
can you provide appropriate isolation so that one user of IOMUX isn't going to muck up somebody else if you've got potentially um, hostile rather than cooperating right. process? How would, uh, how would it work in a hostile environment? That's, uh, that's a difficult question. Um, no, I'd have to think about what the actual, um, what the idea is there. I mean, basically a lot, of what we're, a lot of what we're doing on these kind of systems is, it's not just that they're cooperating, but they're designed to work together. So, um, uh, you know, we're more, we're more worried about things like dropping frames than security, so. Any other questions? You mentioned that the boards um, are going to be or are being made available for hobbyist use. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sorry? You mentioned that the board, like you, the one you have there, is um, being made available for ah, hobbyist use. Right. Um, yeah, we, let's see, we distributed some flyers at JLS in October. They're actually, so this board, I mean, you can come and have a look at it. Um, it's not particularly cheap. It'd cost about a grand or so. But um, with, I guess, with the LCD, big LCD screen and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the idea is that people can play with it and yeah, try it out. Where, um, I should have mentioned that uh, um, so we've also recently set up a site, oss.renesis.com, where we're releasing um, all our BSPs and kernel patches and um, code and, and documentation, this kind of thing. Um, it's actually being set up by Bill Trainer, who um, did a lot of work, uh, similar kind of work for the Beagle board. So we're trying to move towards that kind of um, exposure as well, maybe. So the the the, the um, that that board that you um, that, that, the board you got there, mm -hmm. excuse me, it's the same as the one the image you had of the um, board earlier on. Uh, the picture right? I had, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, this, yep. uh, and that that basically contains this uh, video processing um, hardware. Yes. And, uh, so the. Um, the main chip on this has all of these things inside of it. So it's a system on chip which has, um, which has a core and which has video processors and JPEG acceleration and um, I.O. interfaces and so on. So that's all within the, within the main package. Um, the rest of the board is obviously, uh, because it's a development board, it has lots of ports on it, and so it's just wiring all that up. What um, a, can you give some other ideas of, um, you know, some random ideas of things you could do with it? Yeah, okay, so um, I guess I could talk a bit more about the board. It, it, has, um, it has two camera interfaces, so you can, uh, industrially, like I'm playing with writing security cameras and stuff like that, and, um, but you could do anything that involves two cameras. We've, uh, I've got an artist mate who's starting to do some demos for us, and he's interested in doing something with dual camera. I'm not really sure what he wants to do, but it might be um, like stereo vision and uh, motion detection and stuff like that. Um, it has three axis accelerometers on it, so we just got a driver for that last week, so you can actually do um, motion things. Um, we've got a, a new camera we're developing, which is um, a, a really high-res camera using some of our um, a, a separate um, video I guess analysis chip, um, which also has uh, video motion detection and um, and much finer control of the sensor on it. So yeah, I mean the the applications are very varied. There are um, this this processor series was originally targeted at mobile phones and also things like set top boxes and um, in car GPS units and that kind of thing. The so the lib bio, lib you know the multiplexing yeah. library that's that's basically handling the zero copy. Um, uh, well, just. Or, or, or yeah, it's, it's just handling the transfer of data in this pipeline of hardware. Yeah, yeah, it's just making sure that um, that the memory is available, that it's the kind of memory that the um, 
uh, that the different units require. One, one block and yeah. not, not written right. to, not, not uh, swapped off or cased. Right. Yeah, right. And so then each, um, so the device drivers themselves are these other user space libraries, like libshvu, libshcodex, codex, um, and then they can get memory, or a tool can get memory from UIOMUX and then use it when interfacing with each of these libraries. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yes. Um, so the, uh, sorry, the, the in-kernel allocation. Um, I didn't write that, Magnus wrote that, so yeah. Um, I, I think, it, yeah. Maybe, yeah, I, I think it's very hardware dependent. It may just be kind of nearly fixed anyway. The, the question I'd like to ask is about uh, monolithic versus microkernels, but the, the simpler question that's maybe more directly relevant to your talk is um, do you have any comparison of uh, UIO MUX versus doing this kind of multiplexing in kernel? I don't have a comparison of that, so no. I think uh, as far as the first question, that would be a really interesting thing to talk about over dinner tonight, maybe with someone like Peter or anyone else who's um, into that kind of thing? Um, this might have to be the last one. Uh, just looking at the VPU support, at the moment that's only rated through to D1. Sorry? Uh, you've got VPU5 for handling MPEG4, H264, VC1. Mm -hmm. Are you saying D1, so just up to 576? Oh, so actually the... Um, This is a 7724 slide, I think. Um, the chip supports, um, okay, so this diagram came from marketing. The chip actually supports five codecs. Um, the, mi <laughs> the middleware that we use only supports two, MPEG-4 and H.264. Um, it may support H.263, depending which headers you include or something like that. It was um, more a case around profiles and resolution capability. Sorry, is there? Well, um, does it support the full suite of H.264 profiles? And so it's documented as supporting baseline 2.1. 2 um, it does actually support 720p, but not at the specification required for baseline level 3. OK, so it won't support uh, broadcast HD in most countries? I guess not, no. Yeah, we, we can't we can't ship it. We can't market it as that. Uh, any one last question, quickly? Okay. Thank you, Conrad. Yeah. Thank you.